All right, we are going to be back in uh, Matthew 19. First of all, thank you, Joey, so much for taking last Sunday. Really appreciate that. Um, we're, gonna, we're still working through the book of Matthew here, and I know we're kind of coming to the end. And just a few chapters on, we get to the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem, which is the beginning of his last week on earth. And so thank you to those of you who have stuck with us through the book of Matthew for the last seven or eight months, I guess. It's been a while, uh, but we are getting to the end with that. I want to read the passage we're looking at today just in its entirety, and then we're going to, again, break it down, look at some different parts with this. So go ahead and let's go to the next slide here. Matthew 19, 16 to 30, it says this. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come back, or then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With this, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you have followed me, will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Again, I just acknowledge that only you can teach us. It's your word that you've given to us to tell us who you are and what your will is. Your Holy Spirit, you've given to us in our hearts to help us to understand your word. And Lord, as we look at this, help us to see a little glimpse of who you are and what you've done. Help us to understand what that means in our lives, where we need to be obedient, where we need to change. But Lord, also I pray that it would be an encouragement to us too, that you're a God who wants to communicate with his people. And I just pray as we go into this next half hour or so, would you help me to speak clearly? Would your words just be so clear through your Holy Spirit in the lives and the minds and hearts of everyone who's here? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, let's go ahead and go to the slide here. And so um, this story, of course, um, is I think a story that we really know. But I want to suggest, and that's good, and I want to suggest something to you that these next two Sundays, we're really going to talk about part one of a greater story and then part two next Sunday. And the reason I say that is because at the end of this chapter here, Matthew 19, verse 30, the end of this chapter of the rich, the story of the rich young ruler, we have this verse here, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And then at the end of the parable of the workers, which we'll look at next Sunday, we have the same, almost the same phrase, but certainly the same idea, so the last will be first, and the first will be last. And so we have two parts right next to each other that both have the same ending. And so this is why I say today, we're going to look at the story, what actually happened, the background, and then next Sunday, we're going to look at a parable that Jesus teaches to actually respond to the response that the disciples have to the first part of the story, okay? Let's go to the next slide here, because what we have here, don't worry, I don't have nine points, I have more, <laughs> 
<laughs> no, no, no. This is just a run-through. Because I want to explain to you, when we look at these passages in the Bible, to look at this in context and see what is going on and what strategies, if we can even say that, I hate using that, strategies Jesus uses, but the way that Jesus actually teaches this. So we start here, and we'll go through this chunk by chunk, don't worry. We start with the man's question. Jesus gives a response. The man has a response, then Jesus has a response, and the man has a response, and then the disciples have a question, and then Jesus gives a response. Now, we're only going to touch on Jesus' response today because I want to take Jesus' response to the disciples' question and move that into next Sunday because that's what the parable of the workers is actually about. And so what we have here at this time, and even today, if you teach humanities in any way, shape, or form, you've done this before. And, and sometimes as parents, we do this too, and it's called sarcasm. But it's not quite the same. When we ask, it's actually it's not the same at all. Just wanted to pull everybody in here. But this idea of asking questions and making a statement to just draw out more and more and more from what people are wondering about, and then helping them to answer that question by themselves as they reflect on a bit you've said, a question you've asked, and just to go deeper and deeper and deeper that way. And so this is a little bit of what we have happening here as well as Jesus talks to this rich young man. Let's go to our next slide. And again, this story we find in the three synoptic gospels, so the three gospels that are similar from the same word, um, and we have this here. So Jesus, then a man comes up to Jesus and asks teacher, or good teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? It's a legitimate question. Or what must I do to inherit eternal life? Or to get to inherit, it's the same meaning here. And so he goes up to him and he knows that Jesus is a teacher and we know that people were amazed by Jesus' teaching because he spoke as one with authority. And we know that people saw the miracles that Jesus did, which would have, if they had known their scriptures and had had open hearts, not closed hearts, would have realized, yes, this is the Messiah because he is a fulfill these are fulfillments of the Old Testament prophecies when he does the miracles. So he spoke with authority. His miracles confirmed his Godness, that he was in tr in indeed the Messiah and that he was God. So he goes up to him and he asks this question. What must I do, what good thing must I do to get or to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus responds, and I don't, I don't want us to say it's, it's sarcastic, or I don't want us to say that he's avoiding the question here, but he says, good, why do you ask me about what is good? Or why do you call me good? Okay? The different gospels here phrase it just a little bit differently. But why good? Don't you know that only God is good. God alone is good. He's the only one who is good. And so he's already creating this, this, this discussion, this basis for this discussion that he's going to have with this rich young ruler. What must I do to get or inherit this eternal life? We want to look at this. Go ahead, next slide. We want to look at this question just a little bit more. And there's really three parts that go to this question. Just because I'm so incredible at PowerPoints, you can probably figure out what my key word here is. Um, looks like an exclamation mark, but it's not. <clears throat> it's actually the most important question we all have to ask ourselves. What do I have to do that's significant, that goes beyond what I have right here and in front of me. Because I know, and, and, and a reminder to myself and my own family with my sister-in-law passing away, that these things here, including us, will end. And so what do I need to focus on? What do I need to do? What, what, what do I need to put my energy and my efforts into so that I can go and have something that's beyond the temporal, beyond everything that's going to pass away? So it's a legitimate question. I want to break this down, though, into three things. What good thing? There must be something that's considered good that would be a fair exchange for what I want. Right? Because he's asking, I do so that I get. So there must be one thing that I'm still missing in my life that's still not giving me that fulfillment 
in my life that I am so desperately pursuing? We do it all the time. I mean, good grief. How many three steps to a better health and a stronger you and blah, blah, blah do I read all the time, right? I mean, what's that one thing I can exchange and start doing so that I can exchange that for something that's meaningful, meaningful for all of eternity? But here's the key question that he asks. And this question makes a lot of sense in the context because he was a Jewish man, a Jewish young ruler who lived in the context of the Mosaic Covenant where there were commandments that God gave to the people of Israel, and if they obeyed those commandments, they would be blessed. And these commandments, if they disobeyed those commandments, then they would be cursed. It was very much, and you've heard me use this phrase before, it was a bilateral, a two-way street, a bilateral covenant. If you, then I will. If you don't, oh, right? That's the parenting style we use. Oh, if you don't do that, oh, you can't even imagine, you know? And, and that's, that's the context that he's in. And this question is so significant because it points us to this idea that he had that he, I, must do something. You see, here we have again a beautiful introduction to the gospel. See, Jesus doesn't waste opportunities. It's a beautiful introduction to the gospel which takes the I completely out of the equation. Because we'll get to it as we work through this argument, this discussion, there is actually nothing that you can do. Because you can't do anything to exchange anything that you do here for that eternal life. And so that's why this question is so significant. And that's why it's a question that we have to ask ourselves. And if you're a Christian, you've got to ask yourself that question again and again and again. Because our natural tendency is to, to, to keep coming up with, okay, well, if I do that, then God's going to be pleased. Or if I do that, then God's going to be more pleased. Or I just did this, so I know God's not pleased with me. See, that's our natural tendency. And that's why the gospel is so counterintuitive. And it's so different. It's such an incredible mystery that's so different because it's not if you, then I. If you don't, then I will do this. Let's go on. Jesus gives him a simple answer. He says, keep the commandments. You know the commandments. Keep the commandments. Again, this answer is part of this larger discussion of the Socratic method of drawing out the answer from this rich young man. But Jesus focuses here on the second part of the Ten Commandments. If we look at the Ten Commandments, we can break them up into two groups or maybe even three groups. We're just going to keep it in two groups for now to keep it simple. And so the first group, the second group, we'll talk with them because that's what Jesus says first. You'd be surprised why he didn't take the first group because you would say, well, that's actually more significant. But he takes the second one. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor, he adds on. That's actually not in one of the ten original commandments. Um, do not defraud, do not covet. Those are different things where he's very, very clear about this. And let's go to the slide here because I've broken this up for us a little bit to help us to understand this. If we take the second group and categorize it under loving our neighbor, you'll notice all of those have to do with interpersonal relationships. When we look at the first group of the Ten Commandments, the first four there, all four of those have to do with our relationship to God. See, these four are about me, God says, and these six are about how you're supposed to do it. And Jesus points this young man to the six on the backside. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness or lie. Don't covet. And then the response of the young man, go ahead, is this. And I don't know how he would have said this with a straight face. <laughs> but then I think about what I would say to my dad after he was scolding me, and I'm like, oh yeah, I get that. I'm not supposed to tell stories about my kids anymore. And so, um, but the young man says, yeah, I did that. All these I have kept. 
Not only have I kept them, but Mark and Luke add a phrase. I've kept all of these since I was a boy. So what? I've done that. There's got to be something more because all of this stuff I've kept. Now, obviously he missed the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus actually expounded on these just a little bit more. But, but, but let's even, I mean, surely he didn't believe this, but even if he did, it would just point to this desire in his heart where he's saying, I've done all of the good things, and I've done all of the right things, and I've done everything that was expected of me by the law. I've done everything that was expected of me by my parents, by society. I've done all of those things, and yet there's still something missing. Because having accomplished all of those things, which of course we know he didn't accomplish all of those things, but even if he had, he, he, he had this whole, this thing that was still missing in his heart. I've kept these since I was a boy. I've cleaned my room every week since I was a child, Dad. I wasn't going to say anything about my kids. All right, let's go on. So Jesus answers. He goes, okay. Again, in this Socratic line of reasoning, if you want to be perfect, sorry about that I, for those of you who are detailed-oriented, I'm not. <laughs> if you want to be perfect, go. One thing you lack, there's still one thing. Now, is Jesus really saying that this is the one thing that's missing? That, okay, you live the perfect life as far as interrelationships go, relationships with other people, great. So the one thing you're missing is get rid of everything, and, fall, and sell everything to the poor. And that's what he says. He says, get rid of all your possessions, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And if you do that, then you're going to have treasure in heaven. And once you've done that, then come and follow me. Now I want to suggest something to you here, and, and, and there's some disagreement about that, and that's okay. Because of the context that this encounter is in, that this story is in, I think what Jesus is doing here is he's actually pointing to the young man to a greater principle. Not so much that you should sell everything. But the greater principle here is this. Go ahead. Don't have any other gods besides me. You see the reluctance the young man had? The reluctance the young man had, I think, is what's significant. Not the action that Jesus prescribed for him to do, because we know, and of course Jesus knew this, that selling everything still wasn't going to get there, wasn't going to get him there, right? Because that's counter to what the overall teachings of the Bible are. It's counter to what the gospel, the doctrine of grace is. You know, this idea of selling everything and going living in a, in a desert with just I want to say loincloth, but yeah, we'll just say it, okay? And living it with just a loincloth, and then, then you're going to get saved? No, that's still not good enough. That still just works. He says, what you have is that you have a God besides me. And in this rich young ruler's case, it was money. It was his physical possessions, and he had so many of them. And this God, this thing that you have that is taking my place is really your idol. See, you're doing all the stuff and the relationships okay, but in your heart, I am not on the throne of your heart because you have gods beside me, and those gods in this case are, is money. And probably all the other things that money would bring with that but that is what Jesus is addressing here, in my opinion. And it reminds me, going back to the Sermon on the Mount, which, which, which I wish this young man would have heard, because he wouldn't have answered the way he did. It says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Jesus' response was, sell everything, give to the poor, then you'll have treasures in heaven. That's the key there, treasures in heaven. Where moss and vermin destroy, and thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, 
and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. It's a perfect example that is included in these gospel accounts of a young man who thinks he was doing everything right, and yet God was not on the throne of his heart. And that's easy for us too, right? I mean, we live, I, I come, my cultural background being more German than anything else, I think, um, you know, this idea of, of doing, of looking right, of, oh, you know, the Mowers don't do that. Um, it's not how it's said. It's said in German, of course. But, you know, and, and it's like the, 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 the <laughs> you know, your, this white yao thing is not only a Chinese thing. You don't, guys don't get the hog that, you know, the outer appearance. We get that, too, in our culture and in some European cultures, you know. So, so, so important. Do it all right. You know, then God will be happy. And, and, and just do all the right things, and God will be happy with you. Useless. God's not on the throne of your heart. Some of the nicest people are as far from God as they could possibly be. That's really sad, but that's the truth. Let's go on. Ah, time. Idolatry is when something takes God's rightful place in your heart. God's rightful place, the place that he deserves, the only right place is to be on the throne of your life the throne of your heart. So there's a question for us that I just want to stop here. We'll get to it again at the very end here. But what's on the throne of your heart? And this interaction with the rich young ruler shows us that loving God, no other idols, was not on the throne of this rich, rich, young, rich young ruler's heart. Let's go on. He heard this, or his face, he went away sad, or his face fell. He's like, ugh. That would mean everything. And not so much the everything of the dongshis and the stuff. No, it's the everything of what my heart desires and what I really want. And then it says this right here. Mar uh, Matthew and Mark tell us, he went away and he went away sad. He had the answer. and He's like, no, I can't do that. Just, I can't do that. And he walks away. And the emotion is not anger. Oh, I can't believe you made me do that. That's how teenagers talk, in case you haven't had teenagers in the house for a while. But, but his heart is sad. He's like, ugh. So all this was for nothing? All this good living, all this white biao, you know, all this like, uh, presenting myself as perfect was for nothing? And he walks away sad. Let's go on. Go ahead and go to the next one here. So now Jesus turns to his disciples. He makes an interesting statement here. He says, it's hard. Truly I tell you, or verily I tell you, it's hard for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Same phrasing here almost in all three Gospels. And again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, historical scholars will say, because um, this is kind of hard to understand, and so I'll, I'll give you one of the theories of what this could possibly mean, is that there was a gate in the wall in Jerusalem that was a small gate. The camels could only go through if you took off all of their load. And that gate was called the eye of the needle. I don't know if it's like this little, little thing in case you had to go out and do something without opening the big city gates. But the idea here, and again, I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically what the eye of the needle is, but it just says that it's easier for a camel to get through that than it is for a rich person to get into the kingdom of God. Now, why is this? You know, why? It's almost like there's this picking on rich people here that happens in these verses. And that's actually, I don't think that that is, this right here, again, looking at the bigger context of things, it's not saying, oh, if you're rich, that's bad. No, not at all. There's lots of verses in the Bible that actually talk about finances. But what it's saying here is that it's easy for us when we have so much of something. For some of you, it's money. For some of you, it's status. For some of you, it's relationships. Whatever it is, you have so much of something that you actually become dependent on that and you rely on that 
And slowly, even as a Christian, God kind of gets scooched over a little bit on this throne of your life, and this thing takes the place of it. This young man was a financially wealthy young man. In this context, Jesus is saying, it's hard for this young man to enter the kingdom of God because money has become his replacement on the throne of his life. For you, it could be relationships. I don't need God. I got all my friends. Oh, I got to do this because then all my friends will have a different opinion of me and they may not like me anymore and this constantly seeking affirmation from outside. And that's driving and controlling your life. In this context, it was a rich man. But it's hard, it's impossible to enter the kingdom of heaven when something besides God is on the throne of your life. Let's go on. Disciples were astonished by this. Of course they were astonished. Because what do we think? Who do we think are the most spiritual people in our community? This is the same today. The ones who are nice, the ones who do everything nice, the ones who give a big offering, the ones who look so perfect on the outside. We all know you yelled at your kids this morning. Okay, I mean, come on, we know that, right? And yet somehow, <laughs> sorry, it's too, too much here. And somehow, like, we still feel like, oh, yeah, you know, I was yelling at my kids all the way over. I mean, I, I, I still remember as a child, my dad was an expert driving one-handed in the streets of Taiwan in his little 1.2 liter Yulong, you know, sedan. And, and it's like his one hand was back here, like taking care of business in the back seat while he was driving to church. It was never me. <laughs> well, sometimes. But, but we, they were astonished because on the outside, this rich young man, this rich young ruler, possibly part of the, 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 Pharisee, the Pharisees, this higher educated group to be a ruler, that he had everything and he looked like everything you would need to get into the kingdom of God. And it's like, nope. And they're astonished. They're amazed. And here's their question. Well, then who can be saved? If it's not people like that, then who's going to get saved? Because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to look like Christians. We're trying to act like Christians. We're trying to, you know, let other people see our good works. We're trying to make sure that everything is just right. So if it's not that, then who can be saved? Go ahead. And Jesus gives an answer that's actually frustrating <laughs> because he points it back to the gospel. He says, it's impossible for you to do this. Impo well, what's impossible? It's impossible for you to be saved by keeping all the commandments and looking good and even being blessed financially. Oh, friends, please, financial blessing, it's not a sign that you're obedient to God, okay? Just understand that. But this guy, you know, he wasn't it. And so guys like this who look good, who've kept everything, who are financially well off, it's impossible. But here's what's possible, and only God can do this. It's possible for God to take a person like you and to completely change you and to take everything that you've put on the throne of your life and God can take all that stuff and he can take it off the throne and he can put himself on that throne. Because here's the thing as part of this. You can try so hard to stop having, other things on, stop having other things on the throne of your life. And if you are not doing that, if you're just trying that on your own, you won't even be successful as that, at that. Because that's only something God can do. It's impossible for you to do it. It's impossible for you to get eternal life. It's impossible for you to be saved. But the good news is everything's possible with God. Even saving you even saving me that's possible with god let's go on and this is the response and i'll just touch on it today here and then i'll get into it next sunday and so peter says oh yeah baby well, he doesn't say that but i'm assuming he's thinking this so that's not good enough but look at us we have left everything to follow you. Look at me. We've left everything to follow you. Why do I say that's the tone of his voice? Because look at the follow-up question. What then? 
what then will there be for us? Jesus, man, we left everything. There's got to be something in it for me. There's got to be something in it for me. Isn't there something in it for us? And Jesus' response, go ahead. Actually, go one more because I'm going to do this. This is my mistake here. One more. One more. Okay. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, he's very gracious in his response, at the renewal of all things when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones. Then everyone who has left, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, sorry, everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, wife, or children, fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. So Jesus says, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's going to be something for you. And let's go back two slides again to my summary here, my closing. And we'll deal with that next Sunday. But I want, us to, I want us to just go back to two questions here, two questions that I'm looking at in my own life, because I can only share with you what God's teaching me. Um, the rest is up to God and the Holy Spirit. And this question reminds me of another passage in Acts, where Luke researched the life of Jesus and researched the early church, and he wrote things down after talking to a lot of witnesses and eyewitnesses. Our rich young man said to Jesus, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get into eternal life? A jailer, a couple years later, asked the same question. A different context and a different answer. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. See, they're in prison. They were arrested for preaching. They're in prison. And they're singing praises to God in the prison cell. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Supernatural here, okay? Because this is not like the walls will collapse, but this is supernatural, something supernatural. God is doing this. And all these, their, their, their shackles, their bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw that the prison doors were wide op were open, he drew his sword. He was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. Under Roman law, if you were in charge of prisoners and they escaped, you would be killed. This is why, do you remember the story of the shipwreck with Paul on it? The soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners, lest one of them escape. Because if one of them escapes, they all get executed, right? So it's better to kill the prisoner than to let him get away. But he's like, well, surely they've all run away, so I'm just going to go ahead and kill myself here because that's the, the punishment that was coming to him. But Paul cried with a loud voice, a sense of urgency, don't harm yourself, we're all here. Again, supernatural that all these criminals, Paul and Silas weren't the only ones in the prison, would stay together. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. See, the way he comes and the way he asks this question is totally different than the way the rich young ruler came. The rich young ruler came and said, there's got to be more. I've already done so much. There's got to be more. I've already done all this. What else? Okay, I uh, can't do that. Sorry. This guy comes to him, comes to Paul and Silas with trembling and with fear, and he falls down because his situation in life is so desperate and so dire, he's got nothing left. The rich young ruler had everything still. The jailer has nothing left. The jailer knows that he deserves death. He knows that. Other jailers that this happened to were executed. Soldiers who let their prisoners go were executed. And so he comes trembling. He knows he deserves death. He says, so what do I have to do? Sirs, calling a prisoner sir to start with, interesting, right? But sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's the same question. Totally different attitude. Was he thinking about his own physical life? Yes, of course. But Paul and Silas' answer is this. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That's the answer. That's the answer that the rich young man was not ready for because he still had everything. And this is the answer that the jailer, who had nothing left, who knew he deserved death, really needed. We know, if you read the story on, he was saved. His whole household was saved. And, of course, all the prisoners were still there. 
But this question, what must I do to be saved? The understanding that I deserve death. Let's go to the next slide. This is a reminder for me too. In my life, who's on the throne? Am I on the throne? I like it when I'm on the throne. I like it a lot. In fact, I think a lot of things in this world would be better if I really was on the throne. Um, you know, even on the, th- I'd be happy to be on the throne of your life too. Make your life better too. You know, I mean, I mean, these absurd thoughts, this is what I actually think sometimes. And, and we do it too. And it's just this, 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 this question, where do I fit in all of this? And if I'm on my throne, there's no room for God on my throne. I'm reminded of this, this verse in Romans 12. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, see, because God is so merciful that I deserve death and he didn't make me die. Because God is so merciful, in view of God's mercy, because he's so merciful, your true and proper, reasonable way response, okay? This is the most logical way for you to respond. Not anything like, whoa, that's deep. No. Because God is so merciful and you deserve death, here's your response. Get on the altar. Make your life a sacrifice because you should have died a long time ago, but you got, you were given life. So I urge you, brothers and sisters, because God's so merciful, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. I read a funny quote one time. I don't know where to find it. I'm sure many people have said it. It said, the problem with living sacrifices is what? Keep crawling off the altar. Problem with me is as soon as I'm ready, it's like, okay, Lord, I submit, I surrender all. I'm on that altar, and just a little bit later, you know, me, I'll go to jail. Just a little bit later, I'm like crawling off the altar, trying to work my way back to get on the throne of my life. And I want this to, 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 to not be, uh, you know, scolding you. I mean, yes, you need to hear this. I need to hear this. But to this be an encouragement to you. God's mercies are new every morning. You can't even get off your own throne by yourself. Let God take you off the throne of your life. You know, what does that actually practically mean? And say, okay, Lord, here's what I really want to do. Here's what I really want to do with my family. Here's what I really wish my kids would turn out. Here's how much money I really want to make this year. This is what all I want. This is what my life is like when I'm on, when I'm on the throne. But I just want to say no to all that and say, Lord, what do you want? What do you want me to do with my money? What do you want me to pray for my kids? You know, I was, I was convicted early on in the life of my kids, to pray very differently for them. I used to pray that God would always keep them safe, and I still do that, that God would always protect them, and I still do that, and God would make their life good, and kind of don't do that anymore because my prayer changed because what if God's plan <laughs> for the life of my kids is to include hardship? Actually, the Bible promises hardship in the life of my kids. It's 100% guaranteed my kids will endure hardship. That's 100% one of the best promises in the Bible. Maybe not best, but for certain. But the prayer is, Lord, for my kids, when they endure hardship, would, it, would you please let that draw them to you? Not spare them of hardship. Because I'm asking God to not give them the opportunities to learn things. But, Lord, but see, that's what it means. Not so much what I want, but God, what do you want with my kids? God, what do you want with my money? God, what kind of husband do you want me to be today? I don't care what my wife did or didn't do yesterday. Well, usually it was my fault. But, 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 you know, but I don't think that way. Uh, and, and what do you want? That's what it means practically to get off the throne and let God be on the throne. And then you get on the altar and say, okay, well, I'm going to sacrifice all I have, all I got. If that means this month I've got to use all my money to give to somebody, then so be it, because God, you're going to provide more. If that means that I've got to really repent of my pride and go to my wife and apologize for 20 years of treating her poorly, then that's what has to happen today. See, that's what it means practically. Get off the throne. Get off the throne. It's not your spot. It's God's rightful spot. Your spot is to be on that altar. Here's the good news in all of it. The Holy Spirit lives in us, and he gives us the power to do it. The Holy Spirit can do this. So for us, the prayer is, Lord, help me to submit, to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, because he will teach me and tell me what is right and what honors him, because even that I can't do by myself. 
Let's go ahead and go two slides forward, three slides, whatever it is. Everything I heard today is true. Read or heard today is true. What needs to change in my life? Get off the throne. I shouldn't answer questions for you. Um, if everything I read and heard today is true, who do I need to tell? Who in your friendship circle, in your family, needs to hear this message? Preferably give them the Bible, read it with them. Then we have some questions which we'll put on the Facebook um, if you want to discuss this a little bit more. But let me pray for us, and then we'll have one more song. Sorry, I went a little bit long today. Father, thank you for your word. Forgive me that I keep climbing on the throne of my life, which is not my rightful place. Thank you that your Holy Spirit can help me to get off, sometimes gently and sometimes not so gently. But Lord, I acknowledge that the throne of my life is your seat and not my seat. Lord, as we sing this song, pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to teach us, continue to work in our hearts to understand this is all about you and not about me. And Lord, help us as we fail, as we struggle, help us to turn to you and to remember your Holy Spirit. Give us everything we need to live a righteous and holy life because of what you did, not because of what I can do. And to rejoice and to find that fellowship and encouragement from other believers. It's all about you. 